All right. Well, thank you so much for joining uh, our webinar today. My name is Nick Esposito. I am the head of cities here at Literati, um, and we're really excited to have everybody, um, everybody here uh, today. Great. So starting my video, so now you can see me. Uh, again, my name is Nick Esposito, and I'm the head of cities here at Literati. Um, we're really excited about this webinar to discuss how to use data to craft uh, single-use plastic legislation and uh, and its effects on it. So very excited to have a great panel today with us. Um, today we have Chris Mitchell. He's the city of Pittsburgh's anti-litter specialist. We have Allison Walaszewski. She is with the Five Gyres Institute and is the policy and outreach manager. And we also have Miho Laguerre, and she is with the Surfrider Foundation and is the plastic pollution policy coordinator. So you're gonna be hearing from these great panelists uh, in just a little bit. Um, also want to thank the Literati team that's with us today. Uh, Jeff Kirshner, our founder, uh, he's here. He is in the um, uh, the Q&A. He's going to be going back and forth and uh, just you know, being part of this uh, webinar. Also have um, Bargavi Mantha and Dr. Natalie Hollinger, who are also going to be in the chat uh, answering questions and uh, and uh, keeping this good conversation going. Um, so this is uh, the second webinar we've done this year. And the first one, we had a lot of great conversation going back and forth. So we definitely encourage people to have conversation going. Um, again, also want to thank uh, Waste Dive, which was one of our uh, partners on this to get the word out. And for everybody, again, for being here, uh, really appreciate it. And we're excited to, uh, to jump into it. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this uh, presentation is being um, recorded. Uh, it will come out with a few other links that we'll discuss throughout the webinar after the uh, after the webinar is concluded. So again, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, if this is your lunch hour or uh, just any other time of day for being on this webinar, and uh, we are going to get started. Um, so the way it's going to work is we're going to start with a couple presentations from our panelists, and then we're going to get into a Q and A. Uh, again, please um, put some Q and A in the uh, in the Q and A section of uh, of Zoom. Um, should you have any questions, and please be active in the chat. Um, and we will uh, start the Q&A after the presentations. So I'm going to start us off. Again, my name is Nick Esposito. I'm the head of Litera uh, cities at Literati. Um, I have the privilege of working with cities and the partners that we have on our um, panel today um, all over the country and sometimes the world to um, use data to make change when it comes to litter. And that's what we're here to do with Literati. Um, but before I kind of talk about exactly what Literati does, I just wanted to talk about why we do what we do, especially when it comes to single use plastic. One second. Sorry, give me one second. Something happened with my. All right. Okay. Oh, slides are advancing now. Great. Um, so when it comes to single use plastic, you know, we're producing more than we ever have on this planet to meet the, the goods and the needs of all the people on this planet, which means that we're consuming more than we ever have on this planet. But as we see with the litter that's accumulating on our streets and our waterways, our waste infrastructure is insufficient to handle all of this, uh, the needs of all of the materials that we're producing as a society and we're consuming. The sad fact is 32% of that waste ends up in our environment, usually as litter, like I said, in our waterways, on our roads, in our parks, and wherever throughout a city. It pollutes our oceans, it hurts our wildlife, and it ends up in our food chain. And yes, this is a pretty stark uh, um, stat that you eat about that much plastic every week from what's ending up in the waters uh, that ends up in our food chain. So whose problem is this? Well, right now cities are getting the bill and that's why I really value and view my work as the head of cities at Literati so critically because cities are really getting hit with having to come up with these solutions. But we're all bearing the cost, whether it's our tax money that goes to funding those waste management of those solutions in cities, to our health and our just quality of life and general environment costs that we have. And again, there is the hard cost. The stat that we go with is about $200 billion a year is spent worldwide by governments, by nonprofits, by even private entities cleaning up the litter that we see in our environment. But when we still go to our cities and we go in our waterways, they're still littered. There's still this litter that's happening. So we're seeing the current solutions just are not working. So we have to come up with better ones. And everybody's looking for data to be able to come up with those better solutions. Nonprofits are trying to support better advocacy campaigns. Brands are want to maintain compliance with new laws against this type of pollution that is coming uh, forward and also to measure their impact. 
and cities. They're trying to create those laws, make policy, make budget decisions, operational decisions, and using better data. Well, that's where Literati comes in about using that better data. We empower people to be part of the solution using our tool and our platform. And our platform is as simple as the old saying that a photo tells a thousand stories. So what we do through our technology is we are able to tell the who, what, where, and when story of litter. So the who is the user that downloads our app or that's working for us as a researcher. The what is the tagging, which I'll get into in a second. What are the actual materials, objects, and brands that we're seeing on uh, the ground? The where, so all of this is GIS located, so you can use that for better mapping and better geospatial analysis. And the when, uh, timing is very important when it comes to litter, time of day, seasonality, things of that nature. But again, the kind of really the heart of our uh, technology and our machine learning is that through this picture, as you see here, we're able to pick up that object material and brand. So we know that it's a cigarette, it's made of cellulose acetate, Marlboro is the brand. Again, it's a wrapper, it's made of paper, Wrigley's is the brand, a can, aluminum, Pepsi is the brand. So we're able to take all of that who, what, where, and when data to do something very important, especially when it comes to single use plastic. And that's analyze and engage. The analyze is really the why is this happening? Why is this litter ending up? Where is it coming from? What is the data telling us? And then the gauge is how do we work together to stop it from happening in the first place? So digging a little bit deeper, especially into some great improvements we've been making on our platform. So our analyze tool and our platform is really the part that we have of our platform to give cities the very, very distinct knowledge to use geospatial data analysis to understand, again, that who, what, where, and when of litter so they can get to the how or why is it happening? So as you see on the right-hand column, these are improvements that are gonna be coming to our platform very soon. I'm very excited to be going through them. Um, you have the object material and brand categories, but, and that's gonna be picked up on those, as you see those right lines, that's what we call segments. So the researchers who went out and collected that data, but on top of that, we can do geospatial analysis. So we can look at that in regards to, okay, where is the, all this litter composition in regards to the transportation stops that are happening in your city? If you know, there's a lot of litter around transportation stops. Why is that happening? Is there not enough trash cans around there? Is it in proximity to other commercial corridors that need to be looked at? Why is this happening and what can we do to solve it? And that's what this analyze platform really allows us to do, especially as you'll hear today around single use plastic, which I'm excited for our panelists to get in in a second. The other side is our engage. And again, that's the, how are we gonna work together to do this? And you're gonna hear about this as well today. Um, but what we have the power from our platform is to create an ecosystem of partners who are getting people to go out into a city to collect data for that common cause of understanding the why is this litter happening in the first place. And we do that through a lot of great uh, work. We can work with partners all over the world um, and country. Uh, we have different um, activity, like as you can see, like a leaderboard of people that are going out there and picking up uh, litter and being engaged. We believe in digital inclusion, and we believe that when people are understand the litter and they're included in collecting it, they're going to be powerful voices in those solutions that you need to form to stop litter from happening in the first place. And again, we're working with these clients all over the world. We have great nonprofit partners, again, Five Gyres, who's represented here today, great city partners like the city of Philadelphia, the city of Pittsburgh, that's here today. Um, and corporate partners as well, because everyone needs to be involved to come up with the solutions to these problems. Because we've got a huge planet to clean, and we're really excited for you to join us on this mission to prevent litter, to create better legislation, to prevent this litter from happening in the first place. So here's my uh, information. Again, this is going to come out afterwards, but as head of cities, I'd love to talk with you. If you represent a city and you're here on this webinar about how we can bring either or um, the Literati uh, in, analyze or engage platforms to your city. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over because the best thing to hear about how a product actually works or a platform is actually hear from the people that are using it. So uh, the first person I'm going to turn it over to to talk about the work uh, that he's doing in his city is Chris Mitchell. Again, Chris is the city of Pittsburgh's anti-litter specialist. And his bio is that he's the project coordinator for the city of Pittsburgh Bureau of Environmental Services, outreach coordinator for the Clean Pittsburgh Commission which he'll talk about a little bit today, and anti-litter specialist for the City of Pittsburgh Department of Public Works. Chris, we're super excited to have you with us today. Thank you so much, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Nick. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Mitchell. work for the City of Pittsburgh as anti-litter specialist. I'm here today to talk about uh, the Clean Pittsburgh Commission and our relationship with Literati. Uh, last year, 
Uh, Clean Pittsburgh Commission bought an Engage account with Literati for promoting individual volunteer efforts during the pandemic when a lot of our normal bigger cleanups weren't able to happen because we were all still social distancing. Uh, so uh, it was used to promote that sort of individual uh, cleanups as well as for use by our various nonprofit member organizations. The Clean Pittsburgh Commission is comprised of representatives from various city departments and such as a Department of Public Works, permits, licenses, and inspections, environmental services, and so on, but also representatives from local nonprofits such as Pennsylvania Resources Council and Allegheny Cleanways, Friends of the Riverfront, and also resident representatives not affiliated with any association, but are just involved in the community and all have the shared goal of working to promote the environmental quality of life for Pittsburgh residents through litter, illegal dumping, and recycling initiatives. Uh, next slide. So in 2021, we wanted to combine three major parts of our agenda for that year. Uh, first, every year the Clean Pittsburgh Commission takes on a neighborhood of focus to support the good works of residents learn, uh, living there. Second, we wanted to find ways to support Pittsburgh taking on its own single use plastic bag ban. And uh, third, uh, we wanted to promote literati. We've been trying to do that through the year, um, through social media, through newsletters, things like that. And we weren't really getting the kind of uh, engagement through that we had hoped for because our reach was actually very small. Um, one of our Clean Pittsburgh Commission members had brought up this idea of like a, a Tupperware party saying Tupperware didn't really take off until it was brought up in a social one-on-one -on -one demonstration. Um, next slide. So the combination of these event, uh, these ideas fit very nicely into a single event. The Clean Pittsburgh Commission will organize a large scale cleanup in Esplin, its neighborhood of focus for the year, activate residents into volunteerism by appealing to their support of a bag ban and uh, use that data to promote that bag ban. And then also provide dozens of free smart grabbers for use with the Literati app to get more people familiar with the platform and teach them how to use it instead of just shouting from the rooftops, use this app, use this app. Um, next slide. Um, I personally have had a lot of success in using the smart grabber along with Literati to take a quick picture of the object and pick it up in a single action. Uh, the instructions on how to make a smart grabber can be found in the resources tab of the Literati dashboard. Um, but just, like I said, despite uh, promoting how easy it is to make a grabber, we're not seeing a lot of evidence on our side that people have taken the time to construct them on their own. So we decided let's just make them ourselves and start giving them out for free as participants of this event. Um, the Clean Pittsburgh Commission funds were used to purchase dozens of uh, smart grabbers for this event and were constructed beforehand. Um, full disclosure, I've ordered all the materials and we're getting them now, but uh, I didn't have them at the time. So you just see me Photoshopping my single one over and over there to make it look like we had a lot of them, but we do. We're, we're giving, giving those out next month for this event. Um, next slide. So by organizing this in-person engagement, we're able to set much more accurate parameters of what our, we want our data to look like on the other side as well. When we were first approached by City Council Person Strausberger's office, who was supporting the bag ban and, and was uh, putting that to City Council, they wanted to use the app to just go out and capture as many plastic bags as possible using it, right? And, and the only problem with that is say we find 40 or 400 or 4,000 bags, great, we've got a really big number, but what does that mean when trying to convince people that there's, a, there's an actual problem in, in the City of Pittsburgh with these? It lacks context to me. I find a much more persuasive statistic is not number of bags, but percentage of trash we found to be bags. Uh, people in Pittsburgh know how littered we are as a city. And we can say, we found 10 to 15% of all litter audited to be plastic bag. That allows people to extrapolate that number to all the trash they see every day. So we want to really pick up everything we can and then use that data to get really accurate measurements. And, and we feel that that's gonna be a lot more um, uh, influential in perception and uh, policy. So this is what we're going to be doing next month. We're very excited about it, but we do need to have that one-on-one -on -one 
uh, contact with our volunteers to really get what we want out of it. And uh, we're very excited for that. And that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. And as uh, as Chris knows, and maybe some people on this webinar, I was when I was uh, zero waste and litter director for the city of Philadelphia, I was very involved with Philadelphia's plastic bag ban passing, and just know how important that digital inclusion and in getting the people not just to advocate, but actually walk into a city council chamber with that data in hand. So I'm really excited to dig a little deeper into that with you later on in the in the discussion. Um, but for now, we are going to turn it over to Allison Walaszewski. Um, to talk about uh, the great work that is going on um, uh, through Five Gyres and our partnership with Literati. So Allison is the Policy and Outreach Manager for Five Gyres Institute, where she oversees education, community science, and policy work at the local, state, and federal levels. She also serves as a co-chair of the Reusable LA Coalition of 26 organizations that work on resolving LA's plastic pollution crisis by championing a culture of reuse through education, outreach, and legislation. She previously worked in Baltimore, Maryland with Blue Water Baltimore to improve local water quality by working with community members to fix city infrastructure through stormwater management projects and through legal and legislative advocacy. A really amazing uh, story and I'm really excited to hear uh, more about the story of what we're doing here with Five Gyres. Allison. Hi Nick, well thank you so much and uh, thank you all for, for joining us today and um, so just a little bit of background about Five Gyres. Uh, Five Gyres Institute is um, an NGO that empowers action against the global health crisis of plastic pollution through science, education, and advocacy. We have over 10 years of experience in scientific research and engagement on plastic pollution issues, um, taking community scientists all over uh, the Five Gyres in the Pacific, uh, lakes, rivers, and oceans all over the world. So for us, research is very important because we believe it is a great way to continuously engage different stakeholders in understanding the science of how to drive impact, as well as conducting community um, outreach and citizen science to implement data-driven solutions. So for us, it's all about connecting the, the science and the data data to inform policies and solutions. So we have a program, um, our citizen science program, uh, or community science program, as we call it now these days, uh, is, our, is called Trash Blitz. And so Trash Blitz is all about developing a robust data set that can be used to further the campaigns, strengthen legislation, and foster better community through environmental stewardship. Um, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, we utilize a random sampling plan to catalog trash by measuring material, item, uh, quantity, and brand. And then essentially we produce a report where we analyze the trends and we can share it with elected officials, corporations, and brands. Now uh, to get a little bit into our partnership with Literati. So obviously Literati is a pretty neat platform when it comes to uh, being able to produce data sets and, you know, really being able to catalog each image of the plastic pollution and trash. So we have uh, conducted um, several trash blitzes um, around the country. Two, we've conducted two major trash blitzes in both um, Los Angeles and in Denver. And so prior, um, in our prior work, we were not working with Literati, but what is really exciting is that in our most recent trash blitz, we partnered with Literati, with Inland Ocean Coalition and Into the Sea, three amazing orgs who are doing some um, inland work. And so we worked with Literati to develop a random sampling plan of 150 different sites. You can see right here, all throughout um, the city of Austin. And what we also worked with with, um, some local um, water quality scientists to overlap areas where they're constantly doing water quality testing and monitoring. And then we were also prioritizing high traffic commercial corridors um, with, and um, ensuring that we had like random, randomized kind of like locations all throughout the city. So ultimately we worked together to um, organize about almost 200 volunteers for 150 different sites and so we partnered with Literati on um, a really hosting a citizen science like researcher platform where we developed a robust training program everyone was able to get qualified through the app as community citizen, uh, citizen science researchers and then um, volunteers went out and uh, surveyed uh, 
trash and here we have a volunteer who's uh, using a, um, a reusable uh, horse feed bag. Um, some of our volunteer organizer partners in Austin were just amazing and uh, in Denver too we uh, used horse feed bags since we've been um, having some volunteers who just have amazing connections volunteering at rescue farms. Um, and so ultimately we just concluded uh, about last week or so our, our trash blitz and so volunteers surveyed um, about I think at this point we're almost over 100 plus different sites and locations but they would uh, survey uh, distance for about 100 meters so about maybe 10-15 minutes depending how fast your stride is and catalog all of the different uh, litter and data. So we're still working on kind of um, annotating the data and we'll be producing a report in the next um, upcoming months. Um, Nick, can I switch to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so ultimately what we do with these reports, which is pretty neat, is we produce the report, we share it with local electeds, uh, local stakeholders, and um, in Denver, you know, it's really neat because we were able to connect with, you know, three different um, council members. And so our partners in Denver are working with them on, you know, identifying, okay, what are, you know, the top types of litter items, packaging brands in, uh, you know, in their districts. And so this is a really neat way to connect with electeds because a lot of times, you know, you can tell, you know, your elected official, hey, you know, this, this, this is really important X, Y, Z, you know, this is what we're finding in our community, in our neighborhood, in our environment. But if you can actually bring them out to do like a cleanup or really, um, you know, do a trash blitz where we're, you know, identifying the brands and kind of auditing, you know, the types, it, this is just a really, a really magical way for your electeds to get involved and really open their eyes and learn through seeing and doing about why this issue of like plastic pollution is really important. And then that's where, you know, as a community scientist, as an advocate, um, really anybody and everybody can, uh, you know, share you know, share this experience and then also, you know, start that, start that journey about, you know, why this is bad, why we need to switch over to reusable solutions and really start to plant those seeds for, um, you know, comprehensive single use plastic uh, phase outs and, and bans. Um, and so in Denver, you know, it was interesting because it was in during the height of COVID. So we were still able to, you know, have about 100 volunteers come out and work, you know, in a very socially distanced way. Um, and then, you know, when we did our trash blitz in Los Angeles, it was uh, pre-COVID, uh, a year or two pre-COVID. So we had a really large, um, really large turnout. But uh uh, you know, and then we were able to do trash blitzes in each of the different like legislative districts in the city of Los Angeles. So we were really able to start fostering those relationships, which were so crucial for um, for some of the work that we're doing now in the reusable LA coalition, because through, you know, through experiences and, you know, community uh, stewardship, we were able to engage our electeds in terms of, okay, why is this important? Why is this issue important? And then we were able to build those relationships with them to, you know, ultimately collaboratively work to uh, pass um, uh, foodware accessories upon request ordinances. And then, you know, we're hoping to work with our, our electeds to also, uh, you know, eventually um, develop a single use plastics uh, phase out. So this is, and this is why, you know, um, having the data and science that really informs your policy and then it like backs up your, your policy is so important because, you know, anybody can do a cleanup, which is, you know, very, always very important, but, you know, uh, a brand audit, a trash blitz, you know, the type of data sets that Literati and uh, trash blitz are able to produce can inform the solutions and really promote um, upstream policies. Thank you, Allison. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as you guys being a great partner, a great example of the partners we love to work with here at Literati, um, also a great example of many partnerships coming together. Like we said in the beginning of this, it takes a lot of different groups to come together to tackle this issue and solution. It's really exciting to see you doing that. I'm excited to talk more about it. Um, so next up uh, for our last uh, panelist, before we get into the discussion, is Miho Laguerre. Uh, Miho is uh, the Plastic Pollution Policy Coordinator for the Surfrider Foundation's Plastic Pollutions Initiative. In this role, she works to stop plastic pollution at the source through effective policy and outreach amongst our network within coalitions and the public. 
She brings over 15 years of policy research and management experience working at nonprofits, government agencies, and academic institutions. She has a master's of environmental science and management from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and just uh, to note, even though we're not currently, um, we don't have a contract yet working together with uh, Surfrider and Literati, but um, really excited uh, to have you here and talking about the data sets that you're all collecting, how you're approaching data, especially around single use plastic bands and progressing the issue. So Miho, thank you. Great. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for having me and taking the time to be here today. It's an honor to be here with Allison and Chris and thanks Nick for, Nick for organizing this. Um, so as Nick gave a great overview, we know that single use plastic is a global and complex problem with up to 11 million tons of plastic entering our marine environment every year. And at the Surfrider Foundation, our focus is to stop the current flow of plastic pollution by stopping plastic at the source. And our organization is dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean waves and beaches for all people through a powerful activist network. network. So I'm excited to be here today to talk about, you know, what our activist network looks like and how do we create meaningful change by advocating for single use plastic legislation. So on the next slide, you'll see that we currently have 79 chapters around 100 student clubs and 500,000 members. Our irreplaceable national network of chapter volunteers serves as the first response to local threats in coastal communities across the US. And on the next slide, um, one program we run using this robust network is our beach cleanups. We host hundreds of beach cleanups throughout the nation every year. And through our beach cleanups, not only are volunteers helping to protect the environment by collectively removing hundreds of tons of trash and recyclables out of our environment, but they are a source of critical data to influence legislation. And then on the next slide, or it's an animation. Um, so volunteers collect this vital data on the trash they pick up. And based on this information, we're able to gain a picture of what items we are seeing in the environment and how we can direct our actions to reduce plastic pollution at the source. So this slide is um, from 2019. We see cigarette butts, water bottles, plastic bags, food wrappers, and straws rise to the top, which we pretty much see every year. And so it's no surprise that our grassroots activists and national experts are working to reduce these top items at the source through the legislation at the local, state, and national level. And so legislation can look like single use plastic bag bans, polystyrene bans, straws upon request ordinances. And then we're also looking into extended producer responsibility or EPR for plastic packaging policies. And without getting into too much detail about EPR, because I know we could have you know, hours and hours of conversations about this. Um, this aims to hold producers more responsible for the waste they create rather than the externalities that currently are falling on taxpayers municipalities, and even beach cleanup volunteers that Nick mentioned earlier. And furthermore, just as we can use the data to direct new policy efforts, we can also use the data track to track the successes of policies. So on the next slide, perfect, thank you. I'm excited to share with you all today the beta version of the plastic reduction policy map that was released a few months ago. And drawing on the efforts of Surfrider's grassroots chapter network, we've compiled a data set that includes over a thousand US plastic reduction laws. And this map is the first visualization of our data set and currently features bag, polystyrene, and straw laws. And our map is another valuable resource in this effort, especially given that it's important to know the details of what laws are already in place when moving forward with drafting new legislation. And the map allows our chapters, as well as other activists and policymakers, a streamlined way to research existing policies and helps pave the way for more comprehensive plastic reduction legislation. So if you click on each icon, and I'm happy to provide a link to this map um, after my presentation, it shows additional information as well. So the year that it was implemented, it has a direct link to the ordinance. So we can go through and read all the various ordinances that are out there and determine what might be the strongest laws or ordinances when moving forward. And so just to note that this is this map is a work in progress. And so we'd love to get your feedback um, if you see any missing laws or links that are broken. So again, I'll, I'll send a link to that. Um, and that's just for the US map. And finally, I just want to note that this was a partnership with the Plastic Pollution Coalition as part of the Global Plastic Reduction Legislative Toolkit and we have many partners that make this possible. Um, I think a theme is, you know, th 
throughout this whole webinar is partnerships and that we need all hands on deck to um, work on this plastic pollution crisis. So this database is based on information from and cross-checked with other data sets maintained by NGOs, academic journal articles, commercial websites, and information crowdsourced from Surfrider Chapters Volunteer Network. And we'd like to especially acknowledge Excel Consultants, Excel Rainman, and Mapper Corinne Tangtrak Wool for their expert pro bono assistance in organizing and visualizing this data. And we'd also like to thank our team of chapter volunteers who are responsible for meticulously entering the policies in the data set. So I'll drop the link in the chat if anyone wants to take a look or play around with it. So thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Miho. Um, we were in a pretty good rhythm there. I was glad getting this, uh, the slides moving, so that was good. Um, so I'm gonna um, stop sharing this presentation and we are going to move into um, our question and uh, answer so people can see everybody on the, uh, on the, uh, the screen here. Um, so again, thank you so much for that overview, Miho, and you know how important these, um, tracking where these plastic bag um, bans are or any kind of like single use uh, policy that you can see what other people are doing, how they're doing it. I know it's gonna hopefully be helpful for Chris and Pittsburgh as they start to formulate um, their work uh, there. So um, thank you for, for sharing that and putting that together and all the hard work that went into doing that. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it to uh, back into to the panel. I'm gonna start with Chris. We have some like, you know, um, kind of more direct questions uh, for your organization um, prepared. Um, so, you know, starting with Chris, and I think you made such a salient point about, yeah, you can go out and say, there's 3000 plastic bags in this neighborhood, but like, what does that really mean in comparison to all the other litter that's happening? So uh, my question to you is how has Literati data helped Pittsburgh to establish a baseline for your litter data? And how does that baseline factor into data on the impending single use plastic bag ban factor in? Uh, I would say Pittsburgh is pretty far behind its municipal peers in, in understanding the importance of the data that has definitely changed in the past couple of years, um, but we're still just now getting up to baselines of understanding where we're at, not, you know, is it better or worse than it used to be? Um, so we're, we're happy to finally have something that we can start pointing to and seeing change year from year. Um, and that's going to be a big part of understanding when we do implement any kind of policy, whether it be a bag ban, whether it be uh, more uh, DPW workers doing this sort of work, can we see an actual change in this data? So this is, this is laying the ground floor for us to start understanding every future action. That, that's awesome. Yeah. And again, I just drive in that point home of that, you know, having that understanding what that baseline is, what the makeup is, what the composition, again, and rather than just seeing, as we all know too much, it's just, you see this just sea of trash and it just looks like it all blends in, but by getting it down to its components, you start to really disassemble it and reassemble something better. So that's really awesome. And um, we're excited that, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the crowdsourcing way and like having people involved and bringing in data. Um, but that's exciting that this is helping you all create that baseline to understand how this fits into the larger picture. Um, I remember in Philadelphia, it was us to go into city council and say, you know, this was the fifth most littered object in, on this city was plastic bags as we were passing the ban. It was very a powerful point to make. So, um, so, so for Allison, um, how can community science experiences be leveraged to engage local stakeholders to impact policy change at the local level? Um, yeah, we're talking about like setting this baseline and getting people involved, but yeah, I'd love to hear more about your experience of, you know, do these people become like citizen science experts on the issue and what do they do with that expertise? Yeah, Nick, that is that is a great question. I could talk trash um, all day, so I am very excited about this question. Um, so, you know, I think the, the first step, right, is that experiential learning and teaching piece that re really getting people involved and getting them jazzed up about the trash that normally they may walk past every day. So, Step one, get people out, get their hands dirty, pick up that trash, you know, really um, identify it. And then, you know, really making the step two, make the connection between a downstream solution and an upstream solution, right? Because, you know, ultimately, especially when you're working in, in neighborhoods where, you know, litter and plastic pollution, you know, can be present uh, every single day of the week, no matter how much you, you know, you pick it up or, you know, whatever have you, you know, um, people see trash all the time. And a lot of times there, you know, there becomes this almost 
complacency when you're working with like volunteers or community groups of like, well, you know, trash is there. Like, what can we do to, to get rid of it other than pick it up? So, ah, great question. And then you, then that's when you really kind of dive into like, okay, what are some of the downstream, you know, solutions we're working on? But then, you know, more importantly, let's turn, turn off, you know, plastic pollution at its source, turn off the tap here. So ultimately, you know, first step, step one, get people out, get them involved through experiential learning and teaching to, uh, you know, the trash cleanups are, are fun. Brand audits are fun. Trash blitzes are fun. They are, they are my favorite sport. Um, if it was an Olympic activity, I think I would win the gold. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so get people involved and then it, have people invite their friends, invite their electeds, figure out, you know, strategically where you know, where you're doing a cleanup, where, you know, you can kind of develop this, uh, you know, your, your uh, robust data set, invite your electeds, get them involved. And then, you know, once people get involved, it's, it gets kind of addicting like any sport, right? So you get folks involved, they become enthusiastic, but they become enthusiastic because you are enthusiastic and because they like your mission. And, you know, so you work with, you know, a collaborative or a collective or a coalition of local groups, um, and then get folks connected to, you know, the leaders, the advocates, the community scientists, the schools, and um, that are doing this kind of work or the policy work in their area. So really build that groundswell. Uh, but the, the starting point is, it, you know, is that first kind of cleanup experience. Then what you can do is get your electeds involved, figure out, you know, based on either the data set or you know, what seems to be kind of like the hot piece of policy in, in your area. So, you know, right now there is the national like, skip the stuff campaign where we are, where you're seeing, you know, um, foodware accessories upon request policies being implemented across the country. And this is being driven by um, the national reuse network and upstream and a lot of local um, coalitions driving, you know, similar, similar policies, um, at, you know, but uh, at the, at the local level. So you're know, really connecting folks to that building that groundswell and that coalition, you know, um, coalition building and movement building to really, uh, push forward, you know, the changes that need to happen. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and thanks for, we'll talk about enthusiasm. You got some enthusiasm going on in here too. So thanks for bringing that, Allison. Um, actually, quick question, but I have a question for Miho in a second that's direct, but to kind of tie in Allison and Chris. Um, Allison, when you were doing the trash blitz, and sorry, I'm forgetting this, but were you using any smart litter grabbers? Because I know Literati's talked about them, Chris did that. Were, is anybody using that in Austin? I, you know, I would love to see a smart litter grabber right now. I have 10, um, 10 really smart litter grabbers and they're my fingers. <laughs> you know, I would love if I could have the cameras attached to these. So Chris, you and I may need to talk about those smart grabbers. And that's, that's what I love about litter ride. That's a big part about getting, it's not just, we have these individual contracts all over the country, but we bring people together as well and have cities learn from each other. So that's really cool. Um, just Chris, real quick question on this. It came up in the chat. Um, are you giving those smart litter grabbers away for free as part of your cleanups? Yes, we are, especially this one in Esplanade, this big event. We will be giving those out free. Um, we've The Clean Pittsburgh Commission has given out regular uh, litter grabbers for free for other events like um, our Garbage Olympics. You were talking about it being Olympic sports. We actually have <laughs> the Garbage Olympics here in Pittsburgh. We're very proud of it. It's 50 year coming up this year. Um, and those have always been very popular. So we think with giving these out using Clean Pittsburgh Commission funds, uh, it may be a mainstay of many of our cleanups going forward. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah, I've always loved the Garbage Olympics in Pittsburgh, really. Uh, so you guys are behind in some ways, like you said, but I think you're ahead in a lot of other ways. And that's one of them. I think it's really innovative. And to Allison's point, making it fun and engaging to do this. Um, so for sure. And excited to get back to talk about a little bit more about that engagement piece in a second. Um, before we do, uh, Miho, you know, this question kind of goes to you is, you know, surf riders collected lots of data through your beach cleanups. And then obviously you've had this single use plastic legislation map. Um, and one thing that came in the chat that I, if you want to address is, because I know that was a screenshot of the map. Someone said, where's Hawaii and Alaska? So if you could speak to that as well. Um, but what is the data telling you about single use plastic pollution trends? Like, what are you seeing through all of the data that you all are collecting when it comes to that? 
Great. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. And yeah, apologies. That is a screenshot. And so we haven't forgotten about our friends in Hawaii or Alaska. It's in there. So if you go to the link, you can kind of play around and move or move the um, cursor around. You'll find those states. Um, and there is data there, too. Um, and regarding your question, I think this comes um, as no surprise. But generally, we're seeing that every single item that makes the top 10 list year after year is made up of plastic. Um, in 2020, nearly 90% of all items collected during our beach cleanups was plastic. And we're also seeing that, you know, smaller fragments of plastic are also being picked up constantly. And this is an issue because of microplastics, as you all probably are aware, you know, these plastics are breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces, you know, which leads to a number of problems. Um, and then also, with the pandemic um, last year, we did pivot to solo beach cleanups um, and we are finding more PPE being collected. And so in our data card, we did adjust um, and added what items we're finding that is um, PPE. And so these figures again, confirm that plastic is everywhere. It's a really big problem and it's not gonna go anywhere without large scale legislative change. For sure. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the big piece of this is, you know, again, coming from city government, knowing that there's a lot of things that we can do. There's design ways. You can do a lot of different things to nudge people in the right direction. But when it comes down to like, yeah, sometimes the massive change has to come from that bigger legislative piece. So that's a really um, a salient point to see, you know, I'm sure all of us have been doing this for a while and like thinking back to like how uphill battle these bands were. Now it seems like they're just taken off all over. And uh, I know, you know, Philly tried banning three times. And when we finally won and 2019, um, it was a 15 to two vote. So it wasn't even close. And it's just interesting to see that evolution. So, um, so thanks for that. Um, so wanted to get kind of into more now, kind of like just general Q and a, um, I'm going to just kind of start with Allison on this one. We want to have everybody weigh in. Um, so, you know, we had talked about a question around, you know, just speaking to the pros and cons of crowdsource data, especially when it's like a one-time snapshot of litter. And then, you know, also to think through like the you know, the pros and cons of like, like, who are the people who do this, right? There was a question in the chat about, you know, if it's mostly young people, because they're learning about data right now, how do they, you know, get adults to buy in who maybe stop learning about the use of data in high school or first couple of years of college? Like, you know, what is the profile of someone doing this? And what are the pros and cons of using crowdsource data to be able to, uh, to um, collect this information? Yeah, so that's a great question. So basically, you know, who is excited to, you know, get their hands dirty and really get trashy? Well, you know, that really, it, it really runs, runs the gambit. You know, we have folks who are, you know, really active, you know, just community engaged community members. You have, you know, members from like Sierra Club and other, you know, kind of environmental conservation affinity groups. You also have folks who are just, who have neighborhood cleanup crews who kind of come out and really care you know what what does their neighborhood look like what you know what does the the city look like and you know just really wanting to get involved then you also have school groups that you, you really have anyone and uh and everyone who, who kind of gets involved in this then you also have personal networks of so friends family members it, it really just takes one person to get excited about it and then they can kind of you know bring a whole a whole crew um so you know in, ter in terms of the profile it's it's pretty varied um but so what are some of the pros and the cons? Well, I would say the first con is that, you know, uh, it's all volunteer based, which is amazing. But if you are relying solely on, you know, volunteer engagement for, for the work that you are doing, you may not necessarily be guaranteed to, you know, complete everything in on your timeline, right? Because, you know, volunteers are golden and they are amazing and they are basically like saints on earth doing, you know, uh, doing our, our good work. So, you know, you really cannot, you know, you have to be grateful for every single minute that a volunteer donates, uh, you know, so their timeline may not be your time. So you have to be very flexible. Um, another, you know, potentially one of the, the pros of, um, 
you know, crowdsource data is that we are able to do trash blitzes in locations and, you know, we're able to do this work collectively together when, you know, we're not potentially even there or on site. So, you know, we found this to be a really incredible community science activation during the pandemic over the past, you know, uh, 15 months or however long it's been, it feels like an eternity because it is socially distanced and, uh, you know, it's also very neat because when you have a platform like Literati, uh, you know, volunteers can see right away exactly what they're collecting. We can analyze the trends very quickly. So, you know, I think it's, it's a great way to really kind of tie into this, like, you know, separate but connected hive mind. Awesome. Now that's very um, great point. I love to go into the profile and the different types. So, and then to the, uh, um, yeah, I'm interested if like your thoughts, Chris or Miho on that. Um, with your experience with that, that is different types of groups. I can say with crowdsourcing, it's something we've been thinking a lot about in the city of Pittsburgh because we as a city rely so much on 311 request data. And that can be thought of crowdsourcing because they tell us there's a pothole here, we go fix the pothole and then we look at all of it on a map and we, we make decisions and policy based on that. But when we did something else where we decided to try our own litter index, which Philadelphia did, we modeled after your work, in, uh, Nick, in Philadelphia for our litter index pilot. And we said, we're going to go ourselves and survey each of these streets and see how much litter there is. And we compared that to our 311 crowdsourcing data. It was almost an inverse map. The most littered places had the fewest amount of requests and vice versa. And so, when you're crowdsourcing data, you're, if you're putting that on a map, you may not see where the problem is. You're just seeing where the most engaged people are. Um, so that is one big con with that. But at the same time, it is something that you may not be able to get on your own in the first place without it. So it's definitely what you want to get out of that data is how you have to consider whether you're going crowdsourced or whether you need to do that internally with a dedicated crew. And I'd say, you know, Chris, you know this, we had the same exact thing happen in Philadelphia, the same exact thing that was told us. And I think that's why, you know, we have the analyze and engage sides of the literati platform is like, it's not, sometimes it's not an either or, it's an and, you need both of them to do that. So that's really interesting. Um, and then also Allison to the whole, you know, during COVID thing, like these virtual cleanups, like this could be a bigger future uh, for this. And, you know, I can, I guess that's the, Miho, what do you think of that with, you know, uh, the work that you're doing? Um, cause you guys are also, um, doing cleanups, uh, and, um, yeah, how does that affect it? Yeah, I would say, you know, echoing Allison about making it fun and engaging. And I think it's a really great gateway to activism is what we call it. And so I think a lot of folks may see surf rider at beach cleanups and that's kind of their initial entryway and making it an opportunity to build awareness about the issue and also, making sure that, you know, these volunteers know that the importance of the data that they're collecting, um, because I think it's also important to kind of minimize the barriers. So they're collecting, you know, all the wonderful information on data cards. And then if we're asking them to upload it to our um, database, then we need to make sure that it's clear and it's easy and they know that what, what is going to happen with this data. And so they're excited and they're engaged and they continue to come back. Great. Um, so just switching gears a little bit, because this has come up a lot in the uh, in the chat. Um, and, you know, I think this is something we talked about before. So there's preemption laws throughout the country. And if for those of you on the webinar who don't know what those are, basically, there are states that will say, you know, a municipality is preempted or cannot make a legislative decision or a piece of legislation on a certain subject. And we see that with single use plastic. So saying that a municipality can't make a single use plastic ban, only the state can. So, you know, Chris, you and I live in a state where this is a uh, is a, an issue that's going back and forth right now. Um, so I just wanted to maybe start with you, like, yeah, how does preemption laws affect um, your work and um, and how can this data really help kind of, you know, um, work against those laws? Um, yeah, so Philadelphia led the charge in challenging that law uh, and we wanted to join that, but uh, within the city, we had to convince not, not only the public, but uh, internally um, city staff, law, all these people that would be worth 
joining this lawsuit with Philadelphia to take on those preemption laws. So having any kind of data to support that, uh, and liter literati obviously being a part of that, but then what has been the state of um, several of our programs over the years that they've asked a lot about what we have done leading up to this in order to convince even ourselves that it's worth taking this on. So having more and more and more is always going to be a high priority. And me, you know, and again, a follow up to like, and if Allison or uh, Miho, you want to address that the preemption side, and even like, you know, Miho, we had talked about this and interested in, you know, one way if like just because a city bans something and it's gone through, that doesn't mean a preemption can't happen in the future. So I know that a lot of this legislation has like continued evaluation, continued efficacy of the ban built into the legislation that it's being monitored. So, yeah, can you speak to that and also maybe how that ties into like, you know, using that to kind of um, overcome some of these preemption conversations? Yeah, I would say that, you know, the evaluation piece is really important. And so we recommend that um, that is built in when developing the ordinance. And so whether it's seeing that um, there's less single use carryout bags being given at a store or the amount of plastic litter found in the environment. So again, I think Chris mentioned more so looking at the percentage. If you have a baseline, you're able to have that context as to how these bag bans are positively affecting a community. Um, and so we say that um, it might be best to um, the implementation or enforcement agency might be the most appropriate entity to um, implement a, a report like this. Um, and so in New York, we know that the New York bag law required that the sanitation commissioner conduct a study two years after the law went into effect. And so making sure that, yeah, what, where these bag bans, where they have the intended outcomes. Um, and I would say on the preemption side of things, yeah, data is really important. And then also, you know, lawmakers wanna hear from their constituents. So making sure that um, we have the data to back it up. And we also have people in their district pounding on their doors and making sure that they hear from them. That's great. Now, yeah, thanks. And that's exactly, I mean, again, it's not just about the, the first ban. It's like, there's all the other things that kind of come with it. And then also continue to make sure you made the right decisions. That's really important. Um, so speaking about making the right decisions, this is a question I had. And again, thanks to everybody in the chat. The chat's going crazy right now. It's an awesome conversation I'm trying to track. And thanks, Jeff and um, Bagsy and, and, and Natalie for being in there. Um, so we had this question about, you know, we know some of the usual suspects, right? You, you know, I think you mentioned plastic bags, polystyrene, things of that nature. But from the data that we're seeing, or how can we use data to better gauge this? Like, what are some of the next like single use materials maybe we're not thinking about um, that, you know, could, you know, be part of these like um, uh, these uh, these legislative uh, actions? And, and then also, like, how are we kind of tracking the where are they coming from? Like, how are we also seeing like the larger prevention of you know, you might ban one in your municipality, but might be coming from another municipality. So um, how are we using data to, to do both of those things? Um, I don't know if Allison or Miho want to pick that up about the, yeah, what are they saying? So um, I can speak to, you know, what is what is the hot item right now? And I would say, you know, it's, it's foodware accessories. So mm. whether that is, you know, your single use plastic fork, you know, those little, um, you know, three in one, fork, spoon, knife, uh, napkin, salt, pepper in your little, you know, like condiment containers. And so, you know, foodware accessories, I think right now are huge, especially during COVID because you've seen just such a rise and an increase in, you know, uh, disposable takeout to go where. So I think that's, that's kind of one of the, the top items that as a movement collectively, we're looking to, you know, um, pass foodware accessory upon request. Uh, ordinances like across the country, um, you see that in the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Uh, you know, so that that that's really what we're looking to kind of um, target right now as a global like movement against plastic pollution, uh, and you know, nationally too, because you know, it's it's ultimately it's something that saves restaurants money if customers have to opt in and if they have to like ask. For oh hey can I have you know a fork, a fork to go with this so that's something that everyone can agree on policymakers um, businesses especially you know post COVID as we're, we're opening up um, you know this is 
there has to be pieces of policy that everyone finds finds agreeable because there are a lot of folks who are hurting in different sectors and businesses right now. So, you know, it needs to be something that is uh, palatable for, for everyone. But it's a step in the first direction towards other types of comprehensive um, phase outs and, and bans. Sounds great. Thanks, Allison. Uh, Chris yeah. or me? I would just add to that, that I think that there is momentum growing beyond these trifecta laws, so bags, polystyrene, and straws being implemented that, you know, people are interested in addressing plastic pollution, the whole crisis upstream and at the source. And we're also understanding that the whole life cycle of plastic from extraction, production, you know, all the way to waste management has detrimental impacts to our community and the environment. And it's also a really big environmental justice issue. So yeah, we are seeing more comprehensive legislation like the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act that Allison mentioned, but really tackling the plastic pollution crisis holistically. So that's really exciting to see. Great. And Chris, plastic bags now, what's next? I'm here for all of it. Whatever they wanna do, I will find a way to support it. Uh, I will gather the volunteers, I will make the flyers, I will do everything I can to support it. I'm not going to be making the decisions. <laughs> so you are you are a public servant after my own heart, my friend. <laughs> love working with you. So um, so I think that's a good place. We're coming up on the hour. I know I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I think that's a good place to kind of end and actually segue into the last point that we wanted to make on the webinar. I'm going to share my screen once more um, because I just want to bring this up. Um, so speaking of that, about, yeah, what are the materials in cities that we're looking for? Um, we're really excited to uh, announce that uh, Literati is actually, you know, we answer a lot of requests for proposals to work with cities. We're actually putting out our own request for proposals for what we're calling the city fingerprint. Um, as Literati, we are trying to work uh, with three cities that we have um, this program built for, that we will do four research periods through a 12-month period in these cities to really get back to that kind of baseline of like, okay, what are we seeing and what are we seeing in relation to other data sets? So we want to ideally work with cities that have a strong commitment to using, you know, um, many different data sources to use data, you know, data to drive the solutions in their cities. So we're looking for cities to give us um, some requests and a proposal, uh, basically on kind of what they want to study, what they want to look at, where they want to collect baselines as we continue to, you know, refine and build out our platform, especially as I showed earlier with our analyze side of really taking it to the next step of geospatial data. Um, so uh, even though we are continuing to work with cities through engage and analyze, um, this is a specific project that we're looking to do um, with three selected cities uh, that we will kind of compare baselines across those cities. So very excited uh, to do that. Um, that'll be a link that'll come out with the uh, um, webinar recording. So after this webinar is over, hopefully tomorrow, you'll get an email with the recording uh, with some links uh, and this will be one of them. So if you're a city that's interested in learning more, please follow the link when it comes up. So I am going to stop that share and I'm gonna come back to say, thank you so much again to Miho, Chris, Allison, the whole Literati team. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, join us on this webinar, especially on this extremely, extremely uh, important topic. Thank you so much to the audience with the great chat. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to working in your city soon. So thanks again, everybody. Um, we're going to hang out for a little bit, continuing in the chat, so keep chatting it up. But I'll let Chris, Miho, and Allison get on with their day. But thank you all so much for joining us again. <laughs>